Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm Carrie Toronto Brainman, the director of the University at Buffalo's Gender Institute and professor of English, and I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker of the spring semester. But before I do, I wanted to share um, in the chat box a link to the upcoming events that the Gender Institute is sponsoring this semester. All events will be accessible through Zoom, and we're hosting our first hybrid event, which will be an in-person event in two weeks with a virtual option. Uh, professor Lidmila Janyan, an assistant professor in American Studies at the University of Warsaw, will be speaking on transgender identities in Poland from 1980 to 2000. And she will be speaking on Thursday, February 24th at 3 p.m. in 107 Capon in the Honors College uh, inside Silverman Library, for those of us who may be a bit rusty about locations. We have the link in the box and I hope very much that you'll sign up. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first Feminist Research Alliance event of 2022. Kenny Joseph is an assistant professor in computer science and engineering at UB, and I came across his work last semester while reading a New York Times opinion piece by Jessica Nordell called This is How Everyday Sexism Could Stop You From Getting That Promotion. In this article, she references her collaboration with Kenny Joseph in creating a simulated workplace that they called NormCore with eight levels of corporate hierarchy and 500 people at the entry level. And their goal was to study the impact of gender bias in the workplace over a 10 year period. And at the core of this computer experiment were the following questions. Is there a way to quantify the impact of gender bias on the workplace over time? And what can this computer simulation teach us about everyday sexism, even the microaggressions that commonly go under the radar? And also equally of importance is what are the limits of this experiment? So I immediately thought that this was a fascinating project and I reached out to Kenny to invite him to participate in this event. And he suggested that we also contact Jessica Nordell, who wrote the New York Times piece and the recently published book, which I happen to have here, The End of Bias, A Beginning, The Science and Practice of Overcoming Unconscious Bias by Henry Holt. It came out last year, 2021. So we reached out to Jessica Nordell and she generously agreed to participate in a virtual book conversation with all of us. So this conversation will take place on Zoom on Friday, April 1st at 12 noon Eastern time. Save the date on your calendar. The registration link is in the chat box. Uh, so please go to Talking Leaves or wherever you buy the book and grab a copy of The End of Bias. We also have two copies in UB libraries to check out. Um, I just started reading it this weekend and it's fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to this book conversation with Jessica on Friday, April 1st. So I wanted to introduce Kenny and Jessica's upcoming event together because they are very much in dialogue with each other. And the Gender Institute is fortunate to be hosting both events this semester. So on that note, I'll pass it over to you, Kenny. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm thrilled to be able to to talk about some of this work. Um, the, the sort of main jumping off point, um, uh, like Carrie said, was this simulation. Um, but I think there's, there's some broader ways in which people have been thinking about the sort of link between computation and the study of gender. Um, I'm not gonna talk in detail about this today, but uh, the title kind of reflects that, that I will sort of touch on those in passing. Um, so just before I get started, uh, I wanna emphasize that I am the least important member uh, by far of a three-person team. Um, so uh, Jess has already been introduced. Um, uh, the PhD student on this project who, who sort of built out the model uh, is Yuhal. Um, so just to, to call out that uh, I was uh, maybe a link between them, um, uh, but, uh, uh, but certainly the least important of the three. So um, I'm gonna kind of talk about two, two and a half things today. Uh, the first is this, this simulation model uh, that Carrie introduced. Um, and then I do wanna spend some time reflecting on kind of the broader role that computing can, and probably more importantly, can't play in the study of gender. Um, and I also wanna link that to sort of the ways that I've been thinking about um, how we should understand uh, kind of the role that gender plays and how we can measure it. Um, one last thing before I, I sort of jump in. Um, 
I'm going to use the terms computation and simulation today. I think those sound like really fancy terms. I want to emphasize that they're really not, right? So uh, computation is just like a, a tool that we have to do something over and over again in a pre-specified way. So if you have a, this thing that you want to do repetitively uh, and you want to try it in a bunch of different ways, computation can be useful for that. And simulation is uh, us making up a pretend world uh, and then seeing what happens in it. So we create the all of the characteristics of this world, and then we use computation to simulate that world over and over and over again, and we can look at what happens in it. Um, one other thing that I won't talk about uh, today, but it is worth, I think, noting, uh, because I think I see it again and again in the context of gender, at least in, in the research areas I, uh, I dabble in, I guess, is this idea of machine learning um, and trying to use uh, sort of uh, these machine learning models to study gender. Um, and uh, the way that fits into all of this is in the context of machine learning, we're trying to teach a computer what to do before it does it over and over again. Okay, so those are some sort of definitions just to kind of keep in mind today. Um, I also wanna try to start with a, a statement of positionality. Um, I will admit this is like not a thing that we do in my research area, um, but I am working more with qualitative scholars um, and learning how useful it can be to kind of state up front the lens through which I'm I'm coming to an area. Um, so so bear with me while I while I, I give this a shot. I guess um, uh, I, I think maybe the the right place to start is I I am in many ways kind of a walking stereotype of of the middle class white dude. Right. I, so I grew up uh, in that suburban bubble and then I came back to it. Um, I played ice hockey and lacrosse through college and I take still cheesy kind of winter pictures in front of red barns. Um, so. Another way to put this is that I have and continue to be enculturated into this heteronormative American white masculinity. And so uh, I think it's worth noting that, you know, from the inside, this worldview perfected over centuries is, is one hell of a drug. When you're on it, what you've achieved is due solely to merit. Um, the failures of others is due to their flaws and you are entitled to anything and everything you desire, right? And so I guess the withdrawal from my heaviest uses of this drug um, have been slow and painful. Uh, and of course, I don't think I'll ever sort of fully recover uh, from it, whatever uh, the term recover means there. Um, but as a person and, and thus as a researcher, I, I define myself by an effort to understand how I and others become imbued in this, in this worldview. And, and what causes many to sort of uh, lean on this worldview with increasing certitude. Um, I also wanna take a second to kind of note that um, I have a particular way of thinking about research and that's driven by um, mentors that I've had, um, both in the questions that I ask and, and maybe more importantly today, how I ask them. Um, so in terms of how I ask them, this is driven maybe not surprisingly by my uh, thesis advisor, Kathleen Carley. Um, I think she probably earlier than almost anyone else saw the use of computation in the social sciences. And so she really has over, over the past couple of decades thought about three different ways in which computation can be used. So one is to study patterns of interaction between people, right? We can use computation to measure and to visualize social networks. A second is to, to study how complex macro social patterns, so measures of inequality, can emerge from simple processes at smaller levels, at the situational level, let's say. And um, that is sort of, uh, uh, that form of question is something that simulation can be very useful for. And then finally, um, if we wanna look across a large set of texts or text corpora or historical data, um, we can use computation to, to study and analyze themes and worldviews that emerge from them. And so Kathleen pioneered um, ways to sort of link content analysis uh, in a qualitative sense with computational methods. So just to say that there are many different ways, right, to use computation uh, in the context of social sciences writ large uh, and also the study of gender, I'm gonna focus today on one of them, which is simulation. And specifically, right, I'm going to uh, talk more about this, this sort of simulation of a corporate hierarchy um, uh, that, that, that Carrie noted, okay? Um, 
The other person that I'll point out that has influenced me quite a bit is, uh, is Lynn Smith-Levin uh, and, and her sort of uh, perspective on affect control theory. So affect control theory is sort of a mathematical sociological theory and it has kind of two big ideas. So the first idea here is that social situations and the identities and behaviors that we enact within them are informed by broadly shared cultural beliefs about who should be doing what to who. Okay. So we enact these culturally shared beliefs in social situations. And second, although I won't talk a ton about this today, affect control theory argues that we can model this mathematically. Um, and so this is sort of the theoretical and mathematical basis for a lot of my work. So again, affect control theory says we have social situations and we have culturally shared beliefs and our situations, the way we behave in social situations is in some respects, our attempt to sort of perform what we think is expected of us, right? In the general case, okay? One thing that affect control theory doesn't do particularly well, and that's gonna be important today, um, is that it doesn't do a great job of thinking about the role that social structures and the distribution of resources play in uh, the link between our interactions, uh, sorry, and uh, the beliefs and norms that we culturally share. Okay, um, one person I think who does a really good job of this and that I'm gonna uh, allude to at times today is Victor Ray in his theory of racialized organizations. Um, at a high level, my interpretation of what Ray says um, is that uh, we have uh, ideologies or shared collective beliefs that we use to justify inequality. We have the distribution of resources uh, that allows us to perform these justifications, right? The inequal distribution of these resources. And we enact uh, behaviors at sort of the, the situational level that continue to reinforce both these beliefs and these unequal distributions. So you can think today uh, uh, just about, so I'm gonna use kind of these images of the situational interaction, um, the, the structure and resource distribution and the collective beliefs and norms sort of as I try to describe in a, 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 bit, a bit more detail this, this simulation model. All right, so uh, let's move on now to like what this simulation uh, actually does and what we can say from it. Um, I'm not going to uh, uh, try to tell the folks on this call uh, about the, the importance of the meaning of the glass ceiling, but I, I think the statistic is pretty dramatic. So I, I do like to start with this. Uh, so the term glass ceiling, right, is uh, the term that uh, at least in some of the literature is, is used to refer to this, this phenomenon that women and people of color are, are blocked from reaching the uppermost levels of the corporate hierarchy. This talk today focuses on, on women um, and, um, uh, if I don't come back to it at the end, I think there's important parts about this simulation. And one of the limitations is it focuses sort of on women and not intersectional uh, um, uh, uh, or more detailed identities that women can take on. Um, uh, so uh, that is like one limitation that we'll, we'll get to, but for the purposes of this, this one is just, for the purposes of this talk, right? The statistic that all women represent only 4% of uh, CEOs of S&P uh, 1500 companies, as opposed to men named John who represent 5.3% is uh, sort of a motivating statistic. And when we talk about the glass ceiling, I think it's, it's fair to say it's been widely studied empirically. Right? So uh, a lot of people have looked at sort of the factors that lead to this glass ceiling. Um, but there's two things that are kind of hard to do with empirical work. Um, one is to consider a lot of causes simultaneously. And so when we do empirical work, at least uh, quantitative, I'll have a note here that I'll I just open up now. I think a lot of what I'm gonna say applies to quantitative work. Uh, I would be interested to hear qualitative or anthropological folks talk about how, whether or not they feel that these claims are adequate for their work. Um, but at least in the quantitative world, most of that work focuses on how do we identify kind of a single cause of the glass ceiling and then test that statistically, right? And so um, that's important. Um, you have to do that uh, to, to try to identify um, uh, uh, something new, um, something important that's happening here. Um, but of course, we think maybe uh, more frequently uh, what's happening is um, 
sorry, not more frequently, uh, right? So, so we don't necessarily need only one cause. Um, we can have a bunch of things happening. Um, and moreover, these things can happen not necessarily at a large scale that we can see in a regression, but at a small scale over time. Um, and these things are also hard to identify quantitatively. So uh, this quote by Lenore Bloom, uh, who is, was at uh, Carnegie Mellon, um, uh, uh, visited Carnegie Mellon when I was there, um, I think sums this up, right? So she was a, a professor uh, at uh, Timmy, who eventually stepped down, and her reasoning for stepping down uh, in part was because of these subtle, bi subtle biases and microaggressions that pile up, few of which on their own rise to the level of let's take action, but, in, but are insidious nonetheless. Okay, so um, the idea here is that uh, there can be many little things over time that add up to something big. And so the way we want to think about this is we want to think about modeling or, or, or setting up a world in which we can observe how these little things continue to add up uh, over a long period of time. Um, and uh, what I've tried to argue is this is hard to do empirically, um, but fairly straightforward in some respects to do with a computer simulation. Okay, And we're not the first people to think of this. I won't talk in detail um, about these two works today, um, but hopefully these slides can be shared. Um, and you can go check out um, these works. We also talk about them in our paper. Um, Richard Martel has a, a really nice paper about using simulation to look at um, uh, uh, the way corporate hierarchies are structured. Um, and uh, there's a paper, uh, also a more recent paper that looks at uh, gender bias in meetings in corporations specifically. So uh, our work differs from them in a couple of, of kind of interesting and we think important ways, um, but we're not the first to, to have this idea that like simulation is useful for these reasons. Okay, so I'm going to introduce this model in kind of four, uh, I'll call it four acts. So in the first act, I'm just going to tell you uh, how this basic model we have of a company works. Okay, um, so I'm not going to talk at all about uh, gender. I'm just going to say, here's a model that we have for how corporations work. Okay, in the second part, then I'm going to say, okay, within this sort of basic structure, there are many empirically identified ways in which interpersonal acts of just gender discrimination happen. So I'm going to, in our model, we introduced six different ways. I'm going to talk sort of, um, uh, slightly more at length about two of them, um, just to give you a sense, right? Um, but we're going to take those and we're going to sort of place them into this general model. So we're going to say here are uh, the, the different things, different ways in which gender discrimination happens in our model, okay? And I'm going to show you that even if we assume those have really, really small effects in any individual instance, towards any individual person, over time, they add up to significant sort of macro level inequality. The third part of this is gonna say, okay, well, um, that's great um, that we can show this, but what your model doesn't do is explain why gender bias or sorry, gender discrimination happens. In particular, it doesn't have, and prior models have not had a really, really had a good explanation for why there's no such thing in the real world as quote unquote reverse discrimination, okay? And so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we think about uh, the reasons why gender discrimination happens and is targeted towards women um, um, and how we, we come to model that in our, in our model. Um, and then the final piece, which I suspect I won't have time to talk about is uh, looking at the role that interventions can play. Okay, so. At the start of our simulation, uh, what we do is we sort of set up a fake corporation. So we have fake people and we set them up into an eight level corporate hierarchy. Um, and uh, we randomly uh, assign them a initial perceived promotability score, okay? So uh, we randomly initialize each level. So there's 50% men and 50% women at each level. Uh, and we assign them this perceived promotability score, okay? And then what's gonna happen is uh, the simulation is gonna proceed in a series of turns. So a series of iterations. And on each turn, each agent 
engages in projects. So um, we can think of maybe a consulting company. These are short-term projects. Uh, and projects are either going to succeed or fail. This is totally random. So, so projects succeed and fail randomly with no dependence on who's engaging in them. The only thing that happens after projects is if you succeed, your perceived promotability within the company goes up. And if you fail, your perceived promotability goes down. After a number of turns, let's say agents engage in 10 projects, um, we have a, 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 a turn. So uh, what happens is, you know, after 10 projects, there's a turn where we do promotions. So let's say the company does yearly promotion cycles um, and you are promoted based on your perceived promotability. So right, intuitively um, agents or people who succeed a bunch will get promoted up the ladder. Okay, in order for those promotions to happen without the, the different levels of the corporate hierarchy growing, some people also randomly leave the company. Okay, so uh, to be clear here, I have not said anything about gender. Um, and I have not said anything about norms. So this is just uh, a company where uh, people get hired. Um, okay, so I wanna, uh, uh, I wanna show um, at this point a visualization that I think captures this um, much more cleanly um, than I will ever be able to do. Okay, so this is from, uh, I wish I could say I had like any hand in this visualization. Um, um, beyond just providing the data. Uh, but I think this shows what's happening in this model, okay? So ignore the different colors here. Uh, so what I want you to just look at is just this top row. And you can see each dot is a person, okay? And some of those people shift up the corporate hierarchy. So it's an eight level corporate hierarchy over time. And when they shift up, then at the bottom, um, we get new uh, random people coming into the company and then people continue up the corporate hierarchy. Okay, um, so that's the sort of high level of this sort of act one, this, this basic model of a corporation, okay? So uh, it makes a bunch of assumptions about the way the world works. Um, the world is, is uh, much more complex than this, um, but uh, it is sort of a basic representation of what we think uh, promotion process of companies um, uh, can look like. Okay, so the second part of this is now to say, okay, we know that gender does play a role. So specifically, there are many, many, many different empirically observed ways in which promotions or the credit allocated to individuals uh, is affected by gender. Okay, so in our model, we we captured six of these. So these may not be the six that you think are the most important. Um, they are certainly not the only six, but they are six empirically observed phenomena, okay? And so uh, I'm not gonna touch on all of these. Um, I'm just gonna touch on the first two because I think they're the simplest to think about. So like I said, when uh, an agent, each turn, each agent, each person in the model um, engages in projects and those projects either succeed or fail. Right? And two, two empirically observed uh, uh, effects of gender uh, in the lab, in the real world, uh, over and over again, are that women get less credit when they succeed, and women are penalized more heavily when they fail. Right? And one common argument here is that these, the effects of these things are relatively small. Right? So um, uh, the estimates of how much uh, uh, being perceived as a man or a woman affects your, um, the credit you get or errors uh, or, or um, blame you get um, are on the order of like one to 5%, right? So one way of saying that is um, these, be, being perceived as a man or a woman uh, um, explains somewhere between let's say one and 5% of the credit that you get uh, when you succeed on a task. Okay, so that's a pretty small percentage. Um, but uh, the thing that a lot of those studies don't account for, right, is that projects happen over and over and over again, right? So in a corporation, if you're in that company for, for let's say, a decade, you're going to be involved in a bunch of projects. And if this happens to you over and over and over again, um, it can add up, 
right? Moreover, the other way to think about it, adding up, right, is if this happens to every woman all the time within a company, then even if it doesn't add up for an individual, it will add up across all women uh, at a larger scale, right? And so the first thing that we show is, is indeed this, right? So um, if you think about women's performance being valued only 3% less or 5% less, um, and you simulate the company for um, sort of what we consider to be something realistic of 10 or so years, um, uh, what you see is sort of a dramatic change in uh, uh, the corporate hierarchy, even with these very, very small biases built in. Okay, and the other point that we make, I won't dwell on this here, but I think it's worthwhile to, to think about is, um, well, which of these different things that we modeled had the biggest effect, right? And there's sort of two ways to think about uh, something that might have a big effect. One is if it affects any individual, significantly, right? So uh, this thing could happen, um, if this happens to you, it totally derails your career. Or we can think about how frequently these things happen, right? And so obviously the thing that is um, the, the worst is the thing that happens both frequently and is uh, very impactful for any individual. But if you sort of weight those two, what we found in our model, and again, this was in our model, uh, is that the things that happen really frequently are the ones that had the biggest effect on these macro level statistics of what percentage at each level of the corporate hierarchy were women. Okay, so um, I can stop maybe there for, for questions um, or comments. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll, I'll move on then. Um, so the second part of this turns to this sort of uh, critique that I don't think anyone on this, this call would make necessarily, but that uh, I think people probably see all the time, right? Which is uh, this question of, well, why shouldn't we expect this to happen to men, right? And I think one way of saying this in the way that I think about these problems is if you look at other models, that try to explain gender discrimination, a lot of what they're saying is gender discrimination happens because men are overrepresented higher level of corporate hierarchy and people will sort of lean on the prototype, right? So if they see people with the higher levels of the corporate hierarchy as being more likely to be male, then they will promote people because of that stereotype, right? I think the problem with this is this notion of the glass escalator, right? So even in, in, in woman-dominated fields, uh, you often see men sort of rise rapidly up the corporate hierarchy, okay? So you can't use this, this sort of prototype argument in these settings where um, uh, the field itself is, is woman-dominated, men are still sort of rapidly climbing up. Right? So the second part of this puzzle is, well, how do we provide sort of a justification for why, gen why our model uh, um, expects gender discrimination against women? Okay. Um, and uh, the way that we're going to talk about this is, I think, rather obvious um, in some respects, um, but I think was interesting for us to think about in terms of a modeling perspective, which is even if a particular company has, me, has more women um, at all levels of the corporate hierarchy, um, the sort of societal norm is that men should be at the top of the corporate hierarchy, right? And so if even within a single company, the animations got uh, confused here. So even within a single company, if we, um, if we see that, uh, we, we need to weight societal expectations as well, right? So if we make this sort of assumption that societal norms don't matter, then maybe this idea of reverse discrimination makes sense. Um, but of course, societal norms do matter. Um, and because of that, um, we can expect that uh, glass escalators will arise unless, uh, unless we totally ignore societal norms, okay? So I won't sort of delve into uh, uh, the full details of this, but uh, at a high level, what this plot shows 
is um, if you assume that uh, over here, that societal norms don't exist, that people are only influenced by uh, uh, social norms within the company, and, and particularly this sort of idea of prototyping within the company, then if the company is dominated by women, uh, so will the upper levels of the corporate hierarchy. Okay. Um, so this is percent, oops, percent of men at uh, the uh, given level of the corporate hierarchy, right? But in contrast, if you assume that societal norms have even sort of a marginal effect, what you still see is that um, there is over time a tendency to promote men up the top of the corporate hierarchy. So I'm gonna jump over the, the quota piece um, where we implemented in our model a sort of quota-based intervention. Um, uh, the takeaway here was again, uh, if you don't think carefully about how social norms are structured hierarchically, then your interventions over time won't have a strong effect because people will be uh, gradually affected by looking outside the company and looking at societal norms, sort of shifting their hiring patterns back in that direction. Okay, so just to kind of summarize here, um, we built a model to show that small acts of discrimination pile up over time. And the reason we did this in a model and not empirically is because it's really hard to observe very small effects and it's hard to, even if you can do that, do that for a long period of time over, let's say, a decade. Um, and I think the second piece here is we try to explain sort of why these acts of gender discrimination are so persistent. Um, and we try to do that by saying, um, OK, you can't only look inside what's happening at the company. You have to understand how this company exists within a societal uh, structure of gender equality. Okay. Um, and we also tried to argue in this case uh, that that simulation uh, as a tool can be useful to think through these sort of complex problems of how uh, these small, a bunch of these small things are kind of adding up together over time to produce a larger effect. Okay, I just want to spend uh, a, a couple minutes talking about other ways that I've thought about the role of computation in the study of gender. Um, one of them is as a tool for measurement. Uh, so uh, I think quite a bit about how to, uh, to measure the perceptions that people have of other people. Um, and one way of doing that is to use computational tools to look at what people write online, in newspapers, and to try to map that into uh, different ways that we can think about um, um, measuring how gender plays a role in those perceptions. Another thing that computation can be useful for is just to scale up existing analyses. Um, so uh, this image is from um, <laughs> some, some still yet to be published work from a, a while ago um, with Andre Simpian, uh, Dan Lermar, and Aniko Hanak, uh, where we uh, looked at uh, patterns in um, hiring in academia uh, and how that mapped to perceptions of brilliance in those fields. Um, using a data set of hundreds of thousands of academics from this ORCID site that you may uh, have seen yourself sort of being logged into uh, as you sign up to submit papers more and more. So we can do this at the scale of hundreds of thousands of people, which is not in and of itself exciting um, per se, but we can do this. Uh, so, so one use of that is that we can do a bunch of robustness checks and look, let's say, at whether or not what we're finding applies equally well to scholars in North America as it does uh, to scholars in South America. So scale allows us to, to do some of these sort of uh, uh, checks to explore sort of the, the cultural limits, let's say, of, of our findings. Um, and the other thing that I'll, I'll sort of promote is that computation can help with qualitative work. Um, and this is an area that I'm really excited about. Um, Maria Rodriguez, who is also uh, now at UB in the School of Social Work, uh, does this kind of work. Laura Nelson has pioneered quite a bit of this in sociology. Um, if you have a bunch of data and you're not sure where to look first for a qualitative analysis, computational methods can help you there. And you might think, um, well, how do I trust these models? I think Maria, um, and Laura have done a really good job of, of sort of as qualitative scholars arguing that these tools can be helpful provided you use them carefully. And so for what it's worth, you know, um, um, uh, my sort of 
oops, my core research really looks at um, uh, how, uh, moving forward at least, uh, looks at how we can utilize both qualitative close reading of methods uh, with these more computational uh, approaches. So I see this kind of the computational models of the snowblower, right? Like um, you're getting rid of the, uh, the top uh, part of the snow from your driveway very quickly, um, but it does kind of a rough cut. Um, and what we need then to really uh, uh, pull out of our driveway because there's still a pretty thick layer of ice is like a, a qualitative ice pick to, to, to sort of chop away and, and get to the real uh, meat of the findings. But I see those two things kind of working in tandem. Um, you can't necessarily have one without the other. The one thing, the, the final thing I'll touch on in, in this quickly is that uh, there's a whole nother field of research um, that talks about how computation kind of is the problem. So uh, computation as a tool that reinforces uh, and, and creates new forms of gender inequality. Um, and I think this is a sort of critical research field. I, um, uh, I, I teach a course that largely kind of looks at this. Um, but I think it, at the core of my belief of this is, you know, I use these tools to understand the ways in which uh, gender bias and gender inequality emerge uh, in data. And so to me, it's kind of like, uh, de facto ridiculous that we would take these same tools that I'm using to understand uh, inequality in the world and use them to make decisions. And so it is an important research field to, to understand how this happens, why this happens, um, um, but it is not necessarily uh, where my work happens uh, because I, I'm, I'm sort of more interested in how we use these tools to understand and expose rather than uh, exposing the tools themselves, okay? And um, the place that I'll close is just with one, side, one slide thinking about, um, again, where computation is useful. And I think, again, computation provides a very broad brush, but it can uh, uh, give us a broad brush of a very big, complex thing, right? And so if we think about the ways that gender exists in the world and how it's perpetuated through social relationships um, within social situations, uh, in terms of the allocation of resources, uh, through the reinforcement of, of societal norms, um, computation can help us think about how all of these things kind of merge together to produce gender. Um, and uh, uh, linking this sort of high level view um, across a bunch of different things within this complex system with more nuanced understandings, uh, deeper understandings, um, within any particular sphere here, I think is, is what uh, I'm excited about in terms of research moving forward. Uh, so with that, um, I will thank you. I'll, I'll pitch Jess's book one more time. Um, and uh, just a note for uh, our uh, some of the work that we're doing in computer science and social work um, uh, is found at the C4SG website. Terrific. Thank you, Kenny, so much. A really wonderful talk and an evocative talk. And I, I have a number of questions. I want to invite people in the audience to either unmic yourself or post a question in the chat box. Um, just to get us started, what are the limits of what computation can do? And what can the humanities do uh, that computational analysis can't in terms of gender discrimination? Yeah, I mean, I think. Um... I think that there's a lot of answers there. Uh, I think one sort of just simple case is that computation, we often make assumptions that we know are wrong um, in pursuit of sort of a, again, this sort of broad burst answer. So the most obvious case in our, in our model uh, that we talk about uh, in, in detail in the paper is that we make this assumption that um, uh, someone's either perceived as a man or a woman, right? So gender is binary, right? Um, why do we do that? Because it's really, uh, um, um, because we're trying to make a particular point about being perceived as a woman and its effects in this model. Um, but of course, there's so much, there's like gender is not perceived or obviously uh, uh, is not a binary thing. 
And so when we try to get a richer understanding, a more complex understanding of a phenomena, um, we need more nuanced uh, perspectives. And I think those nuanced perspectives come from closer readings, closer discussions of more specific situations rather than these sort of broad strokes. Okay, thank you. I, I'll, I'll come back to that, but Eva, I see your hand up. Yeah. Um, thank you, Kenny. I think uh, it, my kind of question sort of follows up on uh, uh, on Carrie's, and I, in a way, you already performed part of the answer to this question in terms of the general framework for your research you are interested in using data and computation and simulation to answer social justice questions rather than say corporate productivity and so that kind of or you know or management of effectiveness or solutionism uh, as a kind of uh, uh, response to social ills. You are not interested in a kind of solutionist, reductivist approach, but really looking at simulation as uh, gathering data uh, as evidence to understand us better the evidence of gender discrimination. And that's a very important framework for me because it kind of goes back to what critical race scholars have been talking about uh, uh, using data as evidence within the larger framework of injustice, like uh, Ida Wells looking for data and gathering statistics about lynching to make it visible, et cetera. But that's very different, say, uh, use of data than racialized policing would be using. So the framework matters a great deal. Uh, it seems to me, the sort of, is it as a, a social justice framework? Uh, how is it defined? And what are then the tools that are uh, used as a support of this larger framework? Because I could see the same tools as you are saying, could be used as simulation in the context of uh, racialized uh, policing in the United States, right? And they have been used in the same way, uh, but for a very different end. So it's, um, mm -hmm. it's it relates to another level of norms and power relations of who has the power and how frequently one has the power to put the social justice framework as the major and get funding for this. <laughs> DARPA and others, right? That's what I'm talking about. But thank you very much. It has been, um, I have lots of other questions, but this has been a fascinating example of what I was looking for. Thank you, Eva. You always uh, are able to interpret what I did better than I realized. Uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, I Yes, I think the one comment I'll add, right, is like computation, certainly statistics emerged from like a, a desire for control and centralization of power. Um, and so like, we really do have to be careful about how we're claiming uh, we use those tools um, given their origins. So um, yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah, and I quite like Eva, the distinction you make that it's not, this research is not solutionist, right? In terms of productivity, it's really diagnostic and looking yeah. at patterns of behavior um, and making the unconscious conscious in a way. I mean, how do you deal? I'm thinking if, you know, if Jacqueline Rose were here, you know, you talk about implicit bias in terms of the unconscious. How, you know, I was thinking, well, maybe that's something the humanities can do in terms of interrogating that, where the computational really looks at, um, would you say it favors the conscious over the unconscious? That so much of what we do, we do without thinking. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting one. And uh, I'll admit I'm sort of just starting to think about, uh, about the right ways in which these two kind of play together. Um, I'll, I'll think, kind of parrot Maria in some ways here and that like, I really do believe that the the, 
and I know it's a simple definition, but like I really do believe that the important way to think about computation is it does something uh, over and over again uh, that is just too big of a task for people, right? And if you think about computation that way, um, there's sort of two roles it has. One is uh, it can help you sort of sift through data that's just too big for qualitative analysis to find things that maybe are interesting. Uh, so we can, let's say the easiest way is if you have a bunch of keywords or, or phrases that you're interested in, it can kind of quickly surface the content that's relevant there. Um, and then once you know what you're interested in, computation is useful um, in that it can learn, uh, you can try to tell it exactly what you're interested in. It can try to go back and search for more of that. Um, but like, I, I think the, maybe this isn't answering your question or, or speaking directly to your point, Carrie, but like, um, I think computation can never really help do the meat of qualitative work, which is reading text um, or, or whatever kind of data you have and, and really coming to an understanding of social systems. Like, I don't, I don't believe computation will ever be able to do that. What it can do is once you have that understanding, it can help you to either display it as we do in simulation or to help you find more evidence of it as Maria does in, in her work. Yeah, thank you. And the significance and the importance of patterning and making those patterns um, aware and visible for us. It, any question, other questions from the group? And, you know, as you're thinking of them, you know, you had mentioned, Kenny, intersectionality before, and how would you bring that into the equation? And I was thinking, because, you know, in reading uh, where you're cited in this book, page 77, 70, she, you know, Jessica does talk about um, thinking about intersectionality and how sexis sexism works for Asian American women versus Black women. Um, how would you bring those variables in uh, to a study like this of comp norm? Or norm comp corp. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there's uh, there's nothing um, there's nothing specific about this work that would say that we only need like a dichotomous representation of identity, right? Um, most of my work, in fact, really tries to focus on more situational identities, uh, and so you could think about um, ways of modeling this either with intersectional identities or just sort of um, other kinds of, of identities that people take on in their everyday lives in which having that identity provokes a particular kind of behavior. Um, uh, and so expanding beyond this binary representation of identity to other levels of identity, I think is possible within the model. It just, it becomes more complex. Right? So it becomes harder to talk about, explain, and justify why your model is doing what it's doing. And so simulation, in many ways, I think is more of an art than a science, um, or equal parts art and science, and that you have to find the simple explanation that makes the point that you want to make um, without, while still admitting that the world is way, way more complex than uh, your model admits. Um, and so you, the, the challenge, just to be try to restate that, with moving to intersectional identities is trying to make a specific argument uh, about the role that intersectionality plays in, in a corporation while still having a model that you can justify and explain to others. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Cody, did you want to unmike or and ask your question or? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess, I guess I can turn my camera on too. I don't know how presentable I am, but here we are. Um, thank you so Very much fun. for a really great talk. And I love sort of the questions and where this has been going. I really like, Carrie, how you described this as like being really valuable diagnostic work. I, I, I see that a lot, right? Like it seems models like these seem like they could help provide additional evidence for things that are often felt, but really hard to prove. Like often cases of discrimination are, they don't get acted on because they're so hard to prove, you know, in a way that makes sense to our current systems. I was, my question is about, well, this work is currently mostly diagnostic and about providing additional evidence. Does it currently, or could it in the future point to possible interventions that could help address the discrimination or like have some way of actually doing something about that? So like, you know, now, 
I think it's good that we could have additional evidence, right? To like, yes, this is a thing. It's here. We we see it. We have more evidence for it now. But then, like the 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 you know the huge question is still like, well, what can we do about it? And and yeah. So does the model maybe currently or could it in the future grow to point to possible interventions or or not so much? Yeah. Thanks, Cody. Um, sorry. So first, I think we keep. Uh, we talk about the roles in computing for social change is kind of where uh, I think um, we slowly got led. I want to uh, push one paper that has the title like roles of computing for social change. Uh, Ready Abdeb is the, the the lead author. Um, and I think she does a better job than I can do it at, at talking through that. Um, so that's not your question, but I you you said it again, Cody, so I wanted to, to push it. Your question, I, I think makes a lot of sense, which is like, okay, well, how can we actually use these to like, enact social change, right? It's like kind of what I got from that. I think one thing that we try to use it for is to say what's not going to work, um, right? So so we implemented uh, for our model like a quota-based simulation where a quota-based intervention, right, where you sort of enforce that uh, you need to, um, for a period of time, a company enforces that uh, X percent of hires need to be women, right? Um, so that is an intervention that is not exactly what happens in the real world, but often is. You could imagine that like someone, a CEO comes in, implements that for 10 years um, and then goes away. And you can say, well, is, is there going to be long term change? And with these models, you can sort of just simulate out um, and see what happens. But there's also a rationale when you simulate out, right? So what we say is that's great. That could change the, the structure and the norms within the company. But again, if if societal norms are persistent, which they are, and you start to bring new people into the company that are enculturated more with the societal norms than within the company, um, it's just gonna go back to where it was. It might take a long time, but it's just gonna go back to where it was. And so our argument there is to say, okay, well, you need to really, if you wanna have like lasting change within your organization, you need to make sure that the norms, the gender norms within your, your company are stronger than, considerably stronger than the norms um, that people get pushed on people um, um, in terms of societal expectations. So like, I think that that's a use of these simulation tools um, in terms of, I think that the use that we found for these tools, both in this project and also we're working on with Maria and, and Melanie Sage and others in social work with similar tools in the context of foster care, is that it's really useful for saying what's not going to work and explaining why. Um, I think saying what is going to work, um, you know, it's useful for generating hypotheses. So you can say, like, in our model, given these assumptions, this thing should work. Um, my preferred approach is like use simulation to generate those hypotheses, um, use data to make sure your simulation is grounded in the real world, and then go run an RCT, a uh, randomized control trial or something to actually test it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Cody. Uh, you know, just to follow, I'll, I'll ask a follow-up question, which is actually a bit edgy. And that is, is one of the assumptions that you're making is that if there's more women on the top of the corporate ladder, then there'll be less sexism and less microaggressions. And if so, isn't that um, a bit Pollyanna? isn't that problematic? Because one of the things that the Cuomo investigation and the report that the attorney general uh, produced out of that was how high level senior women were bullying younger women to silence them about their, um, the experiences of sexual harassment that they received from the governor. And so, you know, again, I, on Twitter, I received a query from someone in Florida saying, I'm being really bullied by my senior woman manager. What do I do? Um, and, you know, these, these are very real dynamics, right, that, that uh, a, a terrible bullying boss can be whatever gender identity, right? The dynamic of power is still there. And I was wondering, how can Normcore simulate that as well, or can it? Yeah, I mean, so I could, uh, I could probably thread the needle here and say why... Uh, that could still fit within the existing model. But I think the better answer here is like, yeah, I think that's a huge gap in what we've modeled. And just like a really good example of how you have to 
be really careful to say what you think is happening in like what you're trying to model and what you're not trying to model and what you can say with that. So the only thing that we tried to model were these six different empirically validated ways that women experience discrimination and what the effects of that were. Um, and all of the other ways, all the other uh, structural uh, um, ways, the ways that you talked about, all of these other ways in which gender discrimination emerges are out of scope for our model. And like, um, I think one thing that we wrestled with for a really long time, uh, and I, I don't think I've ever resolved really, is like what, what it means, yeah, I don't know, what it means to leave those things out. Um, um, I don't have a good answer other than like, all we can do with simulation is be very specific about what we are and aren't modeling and, um, and admit that like future work really might need to take up on the things that we aren't modeling, right? Um, the question I guess is, uh, does what you're saying, Carrie, invalidate what we've done? I think the answer is there is no, right? So like what you're describing would make the situation that we observe even worse. Um, but like there is like this baseline that we've established of like even with these little, uh, little in terms of their effects, um, biases, you see what you see. Right. Yeah, no, that's well said. Cody, did you want to follow up with what you posted and then we'll go to Corinne? Oh, yeah, I was just sort of continuing sort of uh, your, your point, Carrie, about um, it, it's it's been pretty prominent in some big cases in gender discrimination in the games industry recently. I myself work with uh, games in the games industry and um, particularly with there being situations where women are either directors of studios or in, they're in higher up positions and major studios and they either bully women beneath them, like you said, Carrie, or um, or they release statements along the lines of like, well, I personally have not experienced discrimination here, so it doesn't exist at any level is the claim that they make. And so senior women who then actually stand in the way of addressing any discrimination by saying, well, I'm a woman and this didn't happen to me. So it couldn't be happening to anybody else here either. Um, but I, I totally get why that is you know, for the purposes of this model, why it's not there right now. Um, and I had a thought too, I think, Kenny, with your response, that maybe that's a space where there, you know, that's where collaboration with more qualitative methods and, and researchers like comes in, right? Like to do more sort of case study, um, qualitative based work to supplement the model or something, but. Yeah, very good, thank you, Cody. Kenny, did you want to respond to that or we'll go right to Corinne? Um, no, yeah, I don't think I, that was well said. I don't have anything. <laughs> this is more a statement than a question, but I just really, really enjoyed your talk. Thank you so much. You. Um, if only because I always feel like microaggressions, I mean, it is diagnostic, but it's also the only place where you can actually make a genuine intervention. Right. It's like if people were willing to discuss micro microaggression, that's the level at which, right, you could make a real difference because it's easier <laughs> than when the problem has become structural and no one wants to go there. Right. It's just too, too, gar it's too big. And then so people are scared, etc. So it's, it's really at the level of microaggressions that society can hope to, to, to to enact change in ways that are doable and, and easier than when it gets to it. So, so kudos for the work that you do and it's huge, huge, hugely important, so. Thank you, I appreciate that, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. and just, you know, I don't know how many of you are following what's happening in Harvard right now with John Kamaroff in the anthropology department, but if you read the testimony that was just dropped on Twitter yesterday, uh, it's a series of, of microaggressions, right, uh, that began as seemingly innocuous comments, right, that accrued and accrued and accrued over time. So I think that's a really, really important point. Yeah, I, but I, uh, just to like kind of follow up on that, I would, I, I think another weakness that I try to point to of, of our work is 
that we really only um, make this argument about how the quantitative literature has looked at the glass ceiling. And I, if, if folks here have resources on how qualitative or anthropological work has looked at out, imagine that there, you know, it's a bit of a straw man for us to say that empirical work hasn't dug into this. Of course, empirical work has done it into microaggressions, um, but I think it would supplement our work to, to have like um, views on, on that from that literature. Jess has done a lot of that work, but I think, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't do a great job in the paper of, of, of referencing it. She did a better job in her book. But it complements each other. I'm thinking of the, the shovel and the snowplow diagram of your slide that shows the exchanges that happen and the synergies that happen because of that collaboration. Any other sort of concluding comments or, or observations as, as we wrap up here? Really important, really important work. I took a screenshot, and I hope you don't mind, Kenny, of the slide of academia and the kinds of submissions for. And I, I, I'll, I'll probably have to have, have questions about that and how to read those graphs and the different columns of it. But I think it's really fascinating when that kind of data is pointed toward academia, right? Because we are very much structured like a corporation as well, and there are definitely parallels. Yeah, and I can share a link to. Um... A preprint for that we still have we have <laughs> failed uh many times to get that work published but i will at least share a preprint of that work yeah that would be great where you analyze the data for us terrific yeah, sure. yeah. and also uh, carrie i just wanted to say to your point about the humanities in all this i feel like the humanities used to be able to do this work and can't anymore because it's easier to to shoot the messenger when it's qualitative <laughs> in many ways, yeah. right? So, so microaggression is, is something that gets dismissed at the level of the humanities um, much more easily. Um, and so it, this is the importance of interdisciplinary could not be emphasized enough because a lot of gaslighting going on these days. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. and I, I guess the, you know, the, just to speak, I was gonna say this before, but I, I mean, the gaslighting comes in large part from my field. Uh, and so there's like a certain amount of hubris that it takes to, to do these kinds of simulations that I, I'm i very cognizant of. I think this was a particular case where it was useful for Jess. Um, and, but I try to be really careful about uh, how I position computational work in this space um, of, of inequality because it's the root of so much of it. So uh, just like a full admission of, uh, of that sort of challenge. Uh, and, and yeah, I don't know what to call it, but I totally agree. Yeah, Corinne, that you're right on and that's so depressing, right? Where numbers have a kind of anonymity to talk about the interpersonal, where a woman speaking about her experience is discredited right so it, it, we're ironically quote unquote liberated or made visible through uh numbers are they gender neutral is that what it is about you know qualitative quantitative data it removes it removes gender or women's voice from claiming um critique and complaint to bring sarah ahmed's work into it right yeah, no, the interpersonal is absolutely a contested site. That's why I was surprised to see you using it, Kenny, because, and I'm grateful that you are, because women for so long have seen the interpersonal as purely uh, a, a site of vulnerability, right? Oh, that's your own dy dynamic with your boss or with your advisor, how, you know, this is the complaint, the female complaint. Um, but I think uh, Kenny's taking this idea of the interpersonal and giving it a kind of authority that it otherwise wouldn't have. So, which is great, but it's also depressing along the lines of what Corinne was saying. <laughs> yes, simultaneously, so, yeah. All right. So, yeah, so thank you. Our, uh, you know, can, I hope all of you will join us for April 1st when we talk about this book with Jessica Nordell. I have it upside down, I think. And Kenny, I hope you come back for that and, and talk about your role and the collaborative role you played. And, Small. 
And and please join us in two weeks. We're going to be back in person for those of us who, those of you who want to um, brave the interpersonal space of Silverman Library. But we will be there with Ludmila Janian, who's flying in from Poland in the next few weeks, and she will be talking about transgender identities in Poland from 1980 to 2020. We're also going to have a Zoom link for that as well for those of you who would prefer to tune in uh, virtually, and that'll be um, in two weeks. The date of that is, can you help me? I don't think the date is on there. Sorry, February 24th. February 24th. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. This has been a wonderful event. And Ken Kenny, I am so grateful for you, uh, for the work you're doing, the kind of visibility it's getting, and for sharing it with us today. Thank you. I, it's an honor to be able to share it. So I appreciate it. Well, good luck to you with, uh, as you continue with it. Thank you. And thanks, thanks all for everybody. joining us. Thank you.